In this episode, I'm diving deeper into the question of who controls all of our money. I'm only focusing on the United States because they're the world reserve currency, but everything I'm saying affects all of us because central banks around the world are all doing the same thing. So, let's get started. We all know that money is hard to come by and we have to work hard to earn it. But how can all this money suddenly come from nowhere? How is money created? Who's going to pay it back? What does all this mean? And what's going to happen next? In this episode, I'm going to explore the three ways money is created and the consequences of those actions. I'm also going to show you the true origin of wealth inequality. So, if you watch this episode all the way through, you should have a good understanding of what's going on. I'm just trying to help people understand. This journey starts off simple, but by the end you'll start to see the insanity of what we're dealing with. The first form of money is created by the government, which is usually outsourced to the central bank or royal mint, but is still controlled by the government. This physical money is a tiny fraction of the economy and makes up about 3 to 8 percent. This money is created to meet the obligations of private banks. When you go to an ATM to withdraw cash, banks need to make sure they have enough money to meet those obligations. For example, printing a $10 note costs about 3 cents, so the government makes about $9.97 from it. This is called seigniorage. Governments don't create more physical money because of the conflict of interest it creates for politicians. If they could print money at will, they could fund their campaigns or wars, and that could lead to massive devaluation of the currency. The more money you have in circulation, the less it's worth, this is called inflation. When inflation gets out of hand, money becomes worthless. In some countries, like Argentina, Zimbabwe, and Venezuela, this has already happened. The second form of money is created by private banks. In most developed economies, 97% of the money supply is created digitally by banks. So, most money in the world is privatized. Banks got permission to do this by persuading lawmakers. But this has its own risks, if banks create too much money, it can lead to inflation. The third form of money is gold. For thousands of years, gold was used as a physical anchor to keep the money supply and governments responsible. But in 1971, the US stopped converting dollars to gold at a fixed value. This gave them the power to make money elastic. And that changed the world. So, despite politicians supposedly not being able to influence money creation, it's happening anyway. We'll see the consequences of this later in the episode. To recap, the government creates physical forms of money. This money is a tiny fraction of the economy, and governments don't create more of it because of the inflation risk from politicians' decisions. Private banks create the vast majority of money digitally, but this can also lead to inflation. And gold was used as a physical anchor to keep the money supply and governments responsible. Have you ever heard of a bank run? It's when everyone wants to take their money out of the bank all at once. But banks don't always have enough money on hand to cover everyone's withdrawals. To try and fix this problem, banks argued that they should be allowed to create more money than they actually have, based on debt. This is the same way governments create digital money. The idea of using debt as money actually dates back much further than this. English innovators laid the foundation for banks to become the creators of money across the world. In 1704, the English Parliament passed the Promissory Notes Act. Take a look at your screen. What you're seeing is a promissory note. In this case, it's a written promise to pay back the $20 you borrowed. Under the law, this piece of paper was as good as money. Now, we digitize this agreement and call it debt. Whenever I say debt in this episode, imagine this piece of paper, remembering that it's as good as money. So, banks were authorized to use these debt notes to circulate as money. From this point, banks were free to create and destroy debt, and hence, money, from themselves. They could lend out this money at interest. In the modern world, the entire economy is based on these promises. When you go to a bank to borrow money, the banking license gives that bank the ability to create money. Every time they issue a loan, they do this through a double accounting system. For example, if you buy a $500,000 house, the bank creates $500,000 in their account, and you have a $500,000 debt, a promise to pay it back with interest. 
This $500,000 debt can enter the wider economic system because when you bought the house, the owner of that house can use the debt, created by the bank, to buy other things in the economy. So, for us to have more growth, we need more debt. The key point here is that debt is actually money, just from a different point of view. To the lender, it's an asset of money, to the borrower, it's a liability of debt, but they're one and the same. And it doesn't stop there. When banks hold your deposit, you're not the legal owner of that money, the banks are. They keep 10% of your deposits and can lend out 90% of that money to someone else, and so on. This is known as fractional reserve lending. So if they say they'll transfer money to your account, that's wrong, because no money is transferred at all. What we call a deposit is simply the bank's record of its debt to the public, 